now step into the incredible, amazing future as we go exploring tomorrow. Now, here is your guide to these adventures of the mind, John Campbell, Jr. A lot of people have the impression that science fiction is all about machines and gadgets and ray guns. It isn't really. Good science fiction has to do with human beings and the problems that human beings have with machines. Now, not all machines are made of metal. Some of them are machine-like organizations. They can be just as rugged to deal with. Hold it still. Can't you hold it still? I'm not a professional. Model, no, you'll never be. Now, I hold still. Oh. A.S. A.S. Marlin, for that was her name. A.S. was a true gal of the future. But in spite of the all, to us, immeasurable, unbelievable, and undreamable advances that the great science of the future was to make, they still had art. At least, just as the room we're peering into now is an artist's studio, and Paul, he's the handsome chap wearing that artist's smock making those horrible faces as he chips away at his figure of stone. Paul Trieray was an artist, a sculptor. This is the year 2217. What's the matter, Paul? Oh, it just won't be you. It's still metal. I can't make it you, human. Well, I'm not sorry. That means no more posing today. Frankly, my back is beginning to say the same thing. Now, who are you looking at through the window here? Oh! Oh, him. Across the courtyard, huh? Him. Bruce. Dear, dear Bruce. Bruce Randall. That epitome of tactless condescension. The unbearable, the insufferable. Bruce Randall. With his usual idiotic grin. My father's scientific assistant. Oh. Paul, dear. I do wish you'd start working on sitting figures. Mm -hmm. Figures at ease. Do you enjoy breaking my back? Anyway, I do want to finish my work on the projector. Besides modeling as a scientist, I like to try to be one. Oh, you are, you are, I guess. You know, maybe I'm just a conscientious objector, but you are so much more interesting as a human. But the hard stone, my stone block, it won't see it. It won't see you as I see you. Oh. Well, I still don't see how anyone as thoroughly and as abstractedly a physicist as your father and a woman as completely and distractedly a chemist as your mother could have a daughter so different. Different, that is, until uh, lately. Lately? Oh, I do want to finish my work on the projector. Oh. Besides modeling as a scientist, I, I like to try to be one. Oh, Paul. Oh, you idiot, I'm not angry with you. To myself. Oh. Oh, Paul. Paul, no. Like you and your mother and your father and this whole doggone crazy civilization I was born into, results. You and your empirical science. Results are what counts. Ah. Paul! I don't know how to model a perfect figure, but you know how to make a perfect molecule. I can't give you the angles, the degree of sericity of the human head, the radius of the curvature of the forearm. Only one man ever attempted to reduce art to mathematics. It was Leo da Vinci. Well, didn't he live before Picasso? Well, he thought he did. Students said he didn't because his formulas didn't work. Results are all that. Da Vinci lived 400 years before Picasso. Oh, yes. Picasso was a contemporary of the great Einstein. Oh, it's all so long ago and there's so much to do. Results. Paul, mm. I should... Oh, Paul, Paul I, I have so much to do today, but if you don't mind, I, I should say the whole trouble with the little figure of me you smashed was that the ratio between the size of the head to the overall height of the body was slightly oh, too great. Get out! Bye, Paul, dear. Ratio. Oh, how I hate that word. A.S. walked toward her father's physics laboratory, smiling to herself. She liked Paul Trieri. Gradually, the smile left her pretty face. She began to think, as each step brought her closer to him, of Bruce Randall. A.S. had made up her fine little mind to dislike him the day he came to her father's laboratory, though not consciously, because she had a pretty good idea why he had been sent to assist her father in his research on the new accumulator. You see, A.S. was now 20, to 20 years, 12 months, and 27 days on the final and 13th month of her 21st birthday. Automatically, at 21, she knew the Population Control Commission would call her in to decide what type of man she should marry. And A.S. had not the slightest desire to have that decided for her. What she disliked most was that when they had decided, they would, with the aid of the Conditioning and Control Division, make her decide the same thing. 
And more and worse, they'd make her like their decision. Bruce Randall. Well, they'll find it'll take a good bit of conditioning to make me like him. Hi, yes. Oh, hello. Paul's chisel slip. I couldn't help but hear him smash that statue he was doing of you. Paul gets along quite nicely, thank you. Have you finished that accumulator bank Dad told you to hook up, Bruce? NI3? Oh, I guess I haven't. I, I've been making a cape for myself. A cape? I didn't know you were a tailor. Ayes was an excellent technician. And now, on the miniature lathe, she was spinning out an aluminum tube of mysterious shape and design. Intent as she was on her metalwork, she had paid little attention to what Bruce Randall was doing. But he was paying plenty of attention to what she was doing. Only after she had completed some very delicate electronic wiring did Bruce Randall steal out of the laboratory, a grim little smile on his face, too. When she finished her secret little device, which was a little larger, just a little, than the old-fashioned forty-five revolver used in the age of bullets, there was a decided look of determination and decision about A.S. face as she hid the little aluminum weapon under her tunic and went across to Paul Trire's studio. Paul? you were working tonight. I finished what I had to do. Paul, Bruce Randall's not for me. I can't stand Bruce Randall. Uh, what has he done now? Nothing. All he can do is grin anyway. <laughs> it's what the commission may do. I know that geological cross-section has been stuck in my father's lab by the Population Control Commission. I hate him. They'll make you love him. Well, I won't. I won't, I won't, I won't. They'll never make me love him. Population control can make anybody love anybody. I love you, Ias. <sighs> You're the one for me. Oh, no, you're an artist. They'll pick you out an artistic girl. A plus B for me. Ayers is a scientist. Bruce is a scientist. So they'll make us combine and... Well, I'm not going to be told whom to marry. Paul, will you marry me? But... Will you marry me? But bootleg? We can run. We can run far away. No one has ever escaped the eugenics police. Well, just for a month or two or three. Well, I don't understand. When how... eugenic theory meets fact, any theory, if fact is contrary to the theory, then the theory is wrong, not the fact. Put your arms around me, Paul. I'm... No, we can't hide. No one can hide from them forever. But, dearest, by the time the eugenics police find us, it'll be too late. Oh, I love you, A.S. I, I don't know what to say. Pack your things. Well, it's never been done. Not since the start of population control. Only love can know what love is for. Pack. Paul will escape. <laughs> Exploring Tomorrow continues in just a moment. Can a lawbreaker be considered a safe and careful citizen of the community? Of course not. And that same rule applies to motorists. You can't cheat on the law even a little and still consider yourself a safe, careful driver and good citizen. So drive legally, avoid accidents, and arrive alive. They escaped. It wasn't easy to escape the eugenics patrols of the Population Control Commission once the commission had decided whom you were to marry. In fact, ever since the eugenic control had started, after the atomic war fallout made it essential to police the human race, no one had ever succeeded in escaping permanently. When the con control had first been established, the whole population had known the deadly danger the race faced there'd been too much use of nuclear weapons. And the ultimate nuclear weapon is the weapon that destroys the nucleus of human cells so that the children aren't human. There'd been very powerful reasons indeed why men had accepted, originally, the establishment of the Eugenic Control Commission. Ayes knew she and Paul Trire couldn't run and hide indefinitely, but just long enough to create the embryonic fact that was going to break the eugenics theory. In the name of the commission, cease and desist down there. You are under arrest. Stand where you are. The patrol copter, they saw us trying to sneak out of the lab building. Stand back, Paul. Well, what are you doing? Stand back. What is that funny look? They're landing us. Shh, shh, My patrolman, they're... There. Come on. Why, the patrolmen, they're... Oh, my gosh, they Why, they're frozen stiff. That's useful. Come on, help me. What? 
These men there. Will you help me? Well, dead is... Well, he weighs a ton. When you did freeze him into a statue. What's that little aluminum tube? What is that tube? Where did you get that? You wanted to combine with a scientist, didn't you? Oh. Hold on, Paul. And if any other patrol plane tries to stop us... Bruce Randall, huh? Bruce Randall, scientist, huh? Oh, the world is full of scientists, isn't it, Paul? We're going to get married and hide out and have a whole bunch of little artists. What I do? The control committee of the Population Control Commission is now in executive session. I mean, I was willing to marry her. Willing? Address me as Commissioner Stracy, Mr. Randall. I, I was, sir. Yes, sir, very. This is unheard of. A young woman attempting to escape the commission's choice of a husband. I heard, sir. I, I mean, yes, sir. Unheard of. It certainly is, sir. And that she is now... Look at the clock. She is now exactly three hours older than 21. Terrible. Terrible. Yes, sir. We'd have been just about through the wedding now, sir, on our way to our honeymoon, if, if she'd listened to you, sir. The reports are coming in from control points all over the east. She has some sort of new and secret paralyzing weapon... He's brought down four of our pursuit planes. The paralyzer? Yes, sir. I, I thought she'd use it. <laughs> I'll bet she gets away. Our patrolmen have been made helpless instantly. Lucky for her, our planes can land themselves automatically, or we'd add murder. Oh, oh no, sir. She's, she's really a nice little girl. Strap him in. I, no, no, let me go. Please. Strap him in. Uh, very nice little gal. She just thinks she doesn't want to marry me. Let's see what you think, Mr. Randall. Turn on the primary analyzer. I, I like her. She only thinks that she doesn't want to marry me, but she's nice. And, and if I had more time... The primary analyzer was an electronic device to reach the true, basic beliefs of an individual. It had been developed by the population control to short-circuit the sensor of the human brain. It also cut off memory feedback by a complicated attenuator circuit. The suspect could not censor his or her thoughts and could no longer remember what he or she said, all the while leaving main mental process circuits normal. Then A.S. Marlin had a paralyzer that she invented. Yes, sir. Only she didn't develop any protection. What's that? She forgot to. She'll have lots of fun when she tries it on me. What is this protection you have? A cape. A cape? A cloak. You'll probably never catch her. If she can escape, let her. I won't interfere. And the patrols will probably all be paralyzed before she's through with you. It's peculiar. Most. Why don't you want to help? Don't you like the girl we picked for you? Oh, yes, she's wonderful. As clever as any woman who ever lived. And the way she looks at me. I love her. The way she turns her back. That's almost... All I've ever seen. <clears throat> you, uh, you want to play fair, is that it? You don't feel right to help us hunt her down. It's her fight. And the little thing may still win, too. I demand in the name of the commission that you give us this protective cloak or cape or whatever it is. No. Where is this cloak? Send ten men to Randall's laboratory. Search it from top to bottom. They'll never find it. There's a lot of dangerously charged equipment in there. Get going, guards. Find that cloak of his. Our scene changes. The hunt for A.S. Marlin and her partner in escape, artist Paul Trire, has gone all over the east, and control policemen and their planes have been immobilized. The planes sent automatically to Earth, the men painlessly paralyzed. The paralysis harmless, actually, but very effectively putting the police out of action long enough for A.S. and Paul again to escape. But now, picture this. The approach to the old battery bridge. A.S. I see them. Control commission men. Quick. Oh, Paul, here they come. Surrender in the name of eugenic... A.S., quick. Give him the paralyzer. Shh. You got two of them. Shh. But, but, but that one, he's wearing... Some... Well, you're right. He's... Give it to him. He's not in the regular view uniform. He... Shh. Uh -huh. Got you at last. Bruce? The cloak Bruce was making when... Then her lips wouldn't work anymore. And neither could Paul's. And the policeman, who was wearing the strange, dirty gray cloak, signaled for a patrol plane to settle down now. It was safe. And to pick up A.S. and Paul. 
Well, we've got her and get the artist chap, too, eh? It wasn't exactly fair, sir. It, it isn't usual to make a man help as I did. Well, nowadays we aren't used to chasing fiancés, but, uh... <clears throat> Try, uh, try going up to room 73. That, uh, may be more enjoyable. <clears throat> Here, I'll, uh, I'll write you a corridor pass. Thank you, sir. Yes? Ayes? I'm in protective custody. I'm permitted up here on a pass. Paul is being shipped to Greenwich Village. He has to marry a wood-burning artist. Oh, poor Paul seems there's a shortage of woodburn plaques for the walls in our better social clubs. Can I come in? I hear you helped capture me. So I heard when they were through analyzing me. I did consciously root for you. Funny, I never liked the way you smile. But now I think it's awfully nice to have around. Oh, it isn't funny. It's natural. They changed you a little, dear girl. You're supposed to love me now, you know. It's funny. Because I think I do. In fact, I'm sure I do. Well, I suppose they made me feel this way. I suppose I don't really do. Does it matter, dear, in the least? All we seek in life is happiness. If so, does it matter whence it comes or why? Does it matter if it's because someone else thought it wise or because we developed it by associations and contacts that were pleasant? Oh, Bruce. Perhaps, perhaps it does. Because love can be real and not last. It must wear. And only similar characters, similar ideals, similar ideas can make it. And wisdom can help there when the heart is not very wise. Unfortunately, sweet, Till man learned the secret of conditioning, the head could not rule the heart. Does it matter now that love is from whence it came? No, it matters not. and the Population Control Commission lie several centuries in our future. Which gives us a chance to do something to see that they never need to come about. We don't have to have a situation in which someone has to control marriages. Where someone has to clean up the genetic mess that an atomic war could make in our race. We don't have to have an atomic war. Join us for a fascinating adventure in Exploring Tomorrow. Heard in our cast tonight were Vivian Fox, Robert Reddick, and Bradford Hoyt. Script was adapted by Peter Irving from a story by Don Stewart. Produced and directed by Sanford Marshall here in New York. Bill Maher speaking. We pause now for station identification.